morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? I know y'all probably don't know me because I don't usually come to the first service, but hi, I'm Stacy. <laughs> I'm Pastor Derek's wife. <laughs> he does have a wife that he's talked about, and today I get to get him back. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but today, I am so glad to be here. I want to welcome you to Connect Church. We are so glad that you're here. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of our online viewers, as well as our Framingham launch team over at the North Campus. Come on, Ashland Campus, say hello to them. Woo! We're so glad y'all are joining, joining us this morning. They're getting ready over there for our Framingham launch uh, next week is our soft launch, and that's the one that we want to invite you to. If you want to go March 4th next week, go to that one. March 11th is the official launch, and we don't want you to go to that one, you Ashland campus people, because we want to have an accurate count of who's really going to that um, official launch. So we're so excited. We have a day full of great stuff happening today. Today is going to be an anointed message in Jesus' name. And we also have an ordination tonight at 530 we're ordaining four pastors, and it is going to be also an anointed, a very anointed service. So um, there's child care provided for that tonight. So 530, be here. We want to um, enjoy it with our whole church family. So can you say amen to that? <clears throat> All right. So today we are continuing our series, He Said, She Said, and today is from the female perspective. How many were here last week? Okay, awesome. And you all came back because you knew I was speaking. <laughs> so I want to first start out by recapping a couple of things that, um, that PD had said last week. And some of it is just to clarify. And some of it is to say that um, I think we did it, uh, we, we've done really well. We trained each other well. Because when he was talking about last week when I would, you know, he'd come home in the afternoons and I would ask him all kinds of questions. Remember that? And he was like, you know, she was like, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I didn't really do that. I didn't make it sound like I was interrogating the man. But I, I was like, when I was sitting there at first, I was like, no. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I do remember doing that because I was so in love with him. I just wanted to know what his day was like. <laughs> Truly. It, I, I just wanted to know everything about his day. And so apparently we've trained each other really well because now he'll come home and I'll say, honey, how was your day? And he starts going into this long dissertation, all the details. And I'm like, can you just nutshell it? Can you just bottom line it? I just want the headlines. <laughs> So high five, babe. We've done a good job. We've trained each other well. <laughs> the only time I really did want to have the machine gun is when, you know, I had four kids under the age of seven, and he'd come in and he'd go, what have you been doing all day? <laughs> Bazookas. You know, that's, that was the only time I really wanted to have the proverbial machine gun. But, um, but he's, he did such a great job last week talking about the three things that women need, and it's so true. We need communication and leadership and... Security. There we go. Security. Awesome. Somebody was listening. Only one person was listening last week. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but these are important to your wife because, you know, it's not like just telling us you love us on the day of our wedding is not enough. We need continual pursuit until the day we die. Right, ladies? Okay. I have to butter you up because I'm just going to step on your toes just a little bit today. Just teensy weensy hurt and that's all. Um, but I, sometimes I think we women get a little selfish in our thinking that, you know, our hearts are the only one that needs to be pursued. Actually, men's hearts need to be pursued as well. And it's, it's very different the way it looks. We think, you know, well, they're just not as tender, you know. Oh, oh, contraire, mon frere, they are, <laughs> they're tender. And, um, but it just looks very different from his pursuing of our hearts. And so one of the things that is so different about us, well, actually, there's a ton of things that are different about us. We're created differently. Our minds think differently. We have different DNA. Our bodies are different. So why in the world would we ever think that God wants us to be alike? He doesn't. He wants us to be different. And we're going to talk about the different designs. You can see it as far back as, us, you know, in the Garden of Eden. Let's look at um, how we were formed. So in Genesis 2, it tells us that how man was formed and why he was formed. But we see back in Genesis 1, that God had created the whole earth. He had created the animals, but there was no one to rule and reign over it. So therefore, he created man. So let's look at Genesis 2, 7. Whoa, this is far back here. Okay. All right, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Everybody say, Man was formed from the dust of the ground. Man was formed from the dust of the ground. Good job. Remember that. Okay, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So let's skip down to verse 18, and it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Everybody say, Just right. Just right. Okay, so. 
let's pause there. Adam was created to do something. He was created to take dominion over what God had created. That was his God-given stamp of DNA. He was a dominion taker. That's kind of PD's annual theme this year is take dominion. And so Eve was created after Adam to come and be a helpmate to him, a helpmeet. And it's one of these things is um, that, that neither of these designs, a really important thing is that neither of the des- these designs were part of the curse. They were actually what God intended for the man to be like and the woman to be like. But there are certain things that there were consequences to the fall. So let's talk about that for a second. The, the fall, we all kind of know that the fall is when Eve was um, tempted by the serpent to take the fruit of the forbidden tree. She took the fruit, she ate of it, she gave it to Adam. But what we see is Eve was coming out from under Adam's leadership. She went ahead on her own and she, didn't, she wasn't letting Adam lead and her, she co-lead. She actually just went out ahead of him and took it upon herself. That's the fall of man. That's when things started to get cursed. And it went downhill from there because they both ate of the fruit. And then God showed up on the scene and said, we're going to have a little chat. And that's when the curses happened. So again, remember, the original stamp in DNA was man was to do. He was to work. He was designed to take dominion. And woman was designed to help. So that's, that was God intended. But then the curse came. So In Genesis 3, verses 16 and 19, that's not in your notes or anything, but we see that the consequences of the fall was that because woman did what she did, there was going to be pain in childbirth, and there would always be this desire over her husband. Now, men would think, that's not a curse. She desires me. I like that. That's a blessing. Can I get an amen, men? Okay, but that's not what he's talking about. (laughs) That desire is talking about take control over, to have control over her husband. So that was, there was always going to be friction between woman and man's relationship because that was her curse. And then the, the man's curse was that the ground would be cursed and he would always have to work really hard by the sweat of his brow. Okay, so it's interesting to me to see that the curses that happen had to do with exactly how they were created. If you look at it, man's curse, he was created from the dust of the earth, therefore the earth was cursed. Woman was created from man, from his rib, therefore her relationship with him was cursed. Very interesting. Because you know why? When God gives you a God-given stamp and DNA and purpose and design, the devil always wants to twist it and curse it. But if we can look back at the original intent, that's how we can walk in our calling. And man was designed to see chips fly. He was designed to like kill it, bag it, and like make more than he did last week and always be taking dominion and always be like, you know, I, I picture this, you know, the army crawl. He's always willing to go for it in the, in the muck and the guck. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> he's always wanting to do something. And John Eldridge wrote, wrote a book called Wild at Heart. And in it, he, it's, the, it's about discovering the secret to a man's soul. And in it, he says, every man was created for an adventure to live, a battle to win, and a beauty to rescue. Okay, so that's actually their God-given DNA. Like when Adam saw Eve, he was like, at last. Whoa, man, that's just awesome. You know, thank you, God. He wants that beauty to rescue. He wants adventures. He wants something to, to, to overtake. And that's why when we see little boys, when they're, you know, there's, there's no damage to their little mental psyche, that's what they want to do. They want to have adventures. That, that's why they're jumping off refrigerators, you know, they're with their capes flying behind them. That's why they're wanting to do things and have these daring feats. And, you know, as they get older, they play the video games where it doesn't matter what video game is, they're the hero. Whether it's shoot them and kill them, the bad guys and slayer of all things evil, you know, or, or the NBA, like the final shot, I got it, it's me, the MB, you know, baseball, whatever. Whatever it is, that's a God-given design in men. But here's the thing. We women sometimes go, that's so silly. Why do they want to do that? That's ridiculous. But you know what? It's our job to call that out of them. It's our job to give them this perfect adventure for them to be the hero. It's our job. It's our God-given design to actually help them be awesome. It's, it's our design. We're able to do that because we can call that out of them because of how we were designed and how we were created. Okay, so let's take a look at that. We were created from what bone? A rib. Okay, don't you think God could have chosen any bone in the human body? He could have. He had 20 phalanges to choose from, okay? It could have just been that men had one less finger or one less toe than women. 
He could have really, he could have chosen a strand of hair, but he chose a rib. Why do you think he chose a rib? What does the rib do? It protects what? The heart, the lungs, it protects all our valuable inner organs, you know, and in particular, the lungs, because it says he pulled them from the side. So this is our lungs, and our lungs represent our breath. Our breath represents life. So if we, as women, were formed from his breath, of something that protected his breath of life, and we were pulled from his inner parts, then we have the capability of pulling from him whatever is his life. We have the ability to call something out of him that is greatness. And it's so important that we understand that. Because what happens when we don't do that is when a man feels less than or he feels like he's not leading well in certain areas, he shuts down and he doesn't want to be in that areas, those, those areas. Can I get an amen, men? Okay. So when they don't feel competent in an area time and time again, they just avoid those areas. So that's why, ladies, we have to stop browbeating our husbands and actually pull something out of them that is greatness. We can let them be the hero. And you may be saying, you know, well, my husband is incompetent and there's not a hero in him. Well, you know what? How's your way working for you? I mean, do you really think that your slice them and dice them words are really going to one day just cut right to the heart of the matter. The blinders are going to fall off and he's going to jump on a white horse and be a knight in shining armor and start leading all because you just nagged him to death. Is that working for you, ladies? I don't think so. It's What you're doing is you're not nagging him to death. You're actually nagging your relationship to death, literal death. So we, I'm challenging us ladies to change our ways, to be able to speak life over your husband because that is our God-given design. God put that in us to be able to do that and to call out the hero within him. Let's look at the big idea today. This is what all men will tell you. Every man will tell you this. The relationship or environment that makes us feel most competent will ultimately capture our heart and possibly our time and attention. Okay? Every man will tell you that. If you look at your husband and say, is is that true? And he says, no, he's lying. It's true. They all think that. Because the environment or relationship that allows a man to lead and to feel competent That's where he's going to be drawn to. His heart is going to be drawn there. Now, men, don't hear me say this. This is not an excuse for you to sin or to neglect your wife or your family or your responsibilities just because you don't feel your heart's drawn there. Do not hear me say that, or I will pull out that proverbial just kidding. Um, But it's our job as ladies to help them to be successful in our relationship because that's our gifting. So you may say, how do I, you know, what, what does that look like? Well, I, I, you know, our strength is to help him be great. And when we do that, we, um, we actually pull out something that's in them that is God-breathed and God-designed. So um, that's what this series is all about. When we have is the he said, she said, it is two, it is a male perspective and a female perspective of how we should not have any unmet needs in our spouse's life. Because unmet needs get met, right? Okay, so we, we're, that's what we're trying to do here is make sure that you have all your spouse's needs met. So if you're um, not married in this scenario and you're single or you're divorced or you want to be married again, it doesn't matter. You can use these principles in any relationship that you have. It's biblical principles that actually work in any relationship. But we're going to focus today on the marriage relationship. Okay, so th- we're going to talk about today three keys that will draw your man home. All right, are you ready? Okay, the first one, ladies, is to build him up. Everybody say, build him up. Okay, Proverbs 14.1, this is really important. Proverbs 14.1 says that a wise woman, let me get up here. A wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Okay, notice it says a wise woman builds her home. Building my home starts with building the head of my home, building my husband up. And it says that a wise woman, so let's look at Proverbs 15 too, a wise woman, oh, sorry, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. Okay, God has given us ladies wisdom and the ability to see things that maybe men don't see, and that's okay. We're not expecting men to see it, but what we need to do, ladies, is we need to help and train them on how to see some of these things. We need to help them be great. We need to help them see things that is our gifting. Help them be successful in our relationships. Help them lead our families well. Help them understand us. Wouldn't that be awesome? 
Because, I mean, good Lord, how many times have you ladies said, I, I, this is actually a, a question that you could actually raise your hand because I think 90% of women have said this to their husbands at some point. Well, you should know how that makes me feel. <laughs> have we not, ladies? You know what? They don't know. They have no clue how it makes us feel. So what, are we just going to be mad at them for the rest of our lives for not knowing? No. We have to help them. We have to help them be great. And we do it by not nagging them, but by building them up. So what does it look like to build up my husband? First of all, it starts with listening to him. Immediately, I know that there's ladies that go, well, he doesn't talk. Okay? Well, I can almost guarantee you that somewhere along the way he was talking, and you shut him down. Historically, We've been in many a counseling situation where the husband would just sit there and she's like, <laughs> we're like, golly, I don't even want to talk to you, woman, you know? <laughs> but at some point, we ladies sometimes have made our husbands feel like what they're saying is stupid or they're incompetent or that's just ridiculous. Why would you even say something like that? That shuts them down because they don't like to feel incompetent. Okay, so we got to build him up. Tell him he's awesome at things that he's awesome at. Like figure out things that he is awesome at. Thank you, honey, so much for going to work every day and providing for our family. Thank you so much for just being so awesome at bringing in the groceries. You are, oh, that is such a wonderful thing. Thank you, honey, for, so, you just, you are so strong. You can lift so much weight. Do you think I care how much weight he can lift? <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't give a rat's rear end how much weight he can lift. But you know what? It's important to him. Therefore, I'm going to be his number one cheerleader. Because if I don't, somebody else is going to. You know what I'm saying to you? But I am the loudest cheerleader. I'm going to be the head cheerleader. I am his number one fan because it's important to him. And this is where I think, ladies, sometimes we're also selfish again. We think, oh, well, he just, I want him to be really interested in everything that I'm doing and all my scrapbooking and my Pinterest and my shopping, how I got all these coupons. Oh, honey, look at this. But yet, we're going to just correct him on everything that he's doing wrong? How diabolical is that? It's just not right. We have to build up our husbands. And sometimes it is just assuring him that I think he's got it. What's interesting is that when my husband is um, preparing for messages sometimes, I can tell by his actions and mannerisms if he's struggling in, in preparing his message and having it all come together. And what's funnier is when he has headphones on, he can't really tell how loudly he's breathing. <laughs> or how hard he's typing on the keyboard. Those are usually the two signs that uh, something's not going right, okay? So literally, he's strong in every area. His fingers, like, are just... Sometimes I come around the corner and I think, I'm, I know I'm going to, I swear I'm going to see, like, smoke fuming out of the keyboard because he's like this. And he's just sitting there like, go, 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 go. I'm like, wow, whoa. So I'll come in and I'll be like, baby, all right? You okay, honey? Is that keyboard doing all right, you know? <laughs> But he's like, oh, sometimes it's just, I don't know, it's just not coming together. It's just, I'm just struggling a little bit. Okay, now, is that his invitation for me to, like, pull up my Bible and go, well, have you thought about this point? And have you thought about this? And, you know, he's not asking me to help him with his message, although he has sometimes. But it, he ultimately wants me to just acknowledge that he's struggling and assure him that I think he's awesome and that he's got it. And so, you know what? That's what I do. I go, you know what, babe? You are always so anointed. It always, this is your gifting. You're so good at this. It's all going to come together. It's going to touch lives. You're going to be awesome. Okay? Amen. You got it. And then I walk off. And then he still is like, because then the testosterone is going. And then the <laughs> computer is really like, boo, boo, boo. You know? <laughs> but I build him up. I, I'm not having to fix his problem for him. Just like we don't want them to fix our problems. He doesn't want me to fix his problem. He just wants me to know that I think he's got it. I mean, he, I, he, you say what, did I say that right? You know what I mean, exactly. Okay. So, but this is what I do with my kids too. I tell my kids they're world changers because, you know, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So I'm going to tell my kids they're world changers. I'm going to tell my kids that they're awesome. I'm going to tell my husband that he's awesome because I want their heart to trump their mind and their actions and, their, and what other people are telling them. So I'm going to build up my husband. And we as women have that capability, so we need to use it. Um, now, God won't have us do anything without 
it being a benefit to us. So what do I gain from building up my husband? I gain a fulfilled husband who is walking in his calling, which leads to security for me and my family. So it behooves me. I like that word. Everybody say behooves. It behooves me to build him up because security is one of our needs as a woman. I, ha I have a part to play in that. I can do that. So you need to make sure you change your nagging to bragging, okay? And then speaking of bragging, this is our next point, is number two is honor his position. Everybody say honor. honor. This is the number one need of a man, honor and respect. Okay, let's look at what Jesus had to deal with, uh, Mark 6, 4, and 5. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work. Everybody say, could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Okay, notice it doesn't say he would not do. It says he could not do any work there because here's, here's why. When Jesus walked on the th this earth, he was fully God and he was fully man. So he operated under the biblical godly principles that God set up for here on the earth. So he operated out of faith. So when people in his own family and his relatives didn't have faith in him or didn't have, um, they didn't honor him, he couldn't work in that environment. So here's a question for you, ladies. If dishonor hindered Jesus so that he couldn't do any work, could dishonor be hindering your husband from doing great and mighty things in your home? Is it possible that you're living with a potentially great man, but he isn't being honored? we got to honor our husbands. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what that looks like in a few minutes. But Ephesians 5.33, look here at this. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So here it is again, respect and honor. Nothing justifies an unloving husband. That's what y'all were supposed to do last week. Hopefully you did some of your homework, men. And then there's nothing that justifies a dishonoring wife. We, uh, this, is, this is a conversation, I think um, PD had mentioned it last week, but, you know, when the, the man says, you will respect me, and the woman's like, I'll respect you when you act respectable. <laughs> okay, we, we know that conversation because it may have been an actual conversation in our own household in the early years. <laughs> Could have been, maybe. Um, but there's a difference between honoring his position and honoring his behavior, and I wish I knew this 20 years ago. It could have saved us a lot of heartache, a lot of headache. Because if I had just honored his position, and sometimes the only difference is the tone of our voice and the attitude of our heart, ladies. That could be all. I don't have to, honor doesn't mean I have to agree with everything he says or his behavior. It just means I could have an honoring position by lifting him up. He's, he's above me. He's my leader. I need to be able to honor his position, not his behavior. And most of the time, a wife's honor of her husband is, is, has to do with the condition of her heart, not just her actions. There has been many times, again, over the years where there have been couples in our office, and um, that I was like, in my estimation, I saw that this man didn't deserve a hint of honor, the way he treated her, the way he did things, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and, and she would still honor him. And it was so challenging for me because I thought, oh, my gosh, I have dishonored Derek for a lot less than that, even on our good years, you know. It was like, it was challenging. And that's, that's another verse that's, it, that the Bible talks about is it's, it's supposed to win people over when you honor your husband. Um, but when he is honored, he's made to feel like the king of the house. That's when he wants to be at the house. We can draw our man's heart home just by honoring him. So what does it look like? I'm, I'm telling you, one of the worst things that you can do for your marriage is talk negatively about your husband. Can I get an amen from the men? Amen. Okay. They're all like, I don't know. She sa I said to say amen, so ladies, don't get mad at him. Um, but talking about your husband, whether it's behind his back, it always gets back to him. He knows it. He can see it. It's, it's your heart condition if you're talking badly about your, your spouse, your husband. Talk about him in a good way. Derek and I have an agreement that we brag on each other and we tell each other. <laughs> like, hey, honey, I was bragging on you today. And he's like, what would you say? And then I tell him. So my husband always says that with this concept of honor, I can either lift him up or I can level him. And that's what we can do. We have that capability with our words. Honor him in his work. Sometimes ladies don't even know what their husband does. 
They don't even know where he works, you know. So if you don't know, that's your first assignment, ladies, is find out what your husband does. What his, you don't have to know all the details, but know what his title is. Because a man, and again, this is where the, the devil twists it so that we think that uh, his, he just wants to work. That's just what he thinks he's good at. And yeah, that's actually what, the way God designed it. He was created, remember back to the original creation, he was designed to do something. That's okay. So you want to pull his heart home? Honor him in his work because if he's getting high fives and attaboys at work, where is his heart going to be drawn to? Work. So you don't have to be at work to high five him about his work. Draw his heart home. Honey, how was your day? Again, don't, don't barrage him with questions. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> But ask him questions and find out and just say, oh, I bet you're so good. You are such a good leader. Oh, you told that person that. That's a great idea. Honey. You, whatever it takes, honor him for his work because that is God's given DNA and design on them. Are you following with me? Okay. So what do I gain when I honor my husband? I gain my husband's trust and in turn his heart. If, if I honor him, if I talk well of him and speak well of him, I have his trust. He knows that I'm going to be careful with his heart. And again, like I said, we think that sometimes men's hearts aren't as tender as ours. They're just as tender. They, we, we just show it on the outside. They keep it inside. So it's our job as ladies to pull out their heart and speak life into their heart. Now, for the last point today, um, don't get excited because I'm not, I'm not almost finished. <laughs> This last point is a really good big one, um, and it's something that I think has been historically abused in, in the church because of a couple of verses in the Bible, and um, I think this is one that is really good for a female to be able to say this, to, to, to be able to speak this part of the message, and you're all wondering what it is. Anybody want to guess? Submit. Submit to his leadership. Submission, the big S word. Okay. Let me just break it down for you. I was just talking at the 508 um, at the relationship forum, and somebody asked a question, and I, I was telling the young kids this, is that if you just break down submission, sub means under, mission means an accomplish, I mean, a goal to be accomplished or a task to be accomplished. So Derek and I are under the same mission. That's what submission means. And what basically what happens is if we look at Ephesians 5, through 24, it says, wives submit, to yourselves to your, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Let me just see if there's another one behind there. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, should submit to their husbands in everything. Okay, that's the verse that has gotten the big abuse over the years, for centuries. This is the verse that the devil has loved to twist and warp in men's and women's minds. If you, if you look at the verse right before it, the overarching verse, Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. So look at your spouse if you are married and say, We're going to submit to one another. Did you do it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so we got to submit to one another. It doesn't mean, it, it, it goes into talking about, here's the overarching verse, and then it says, wives, here's your couple of verses. This is how you're going to submit. And then men, here's your eight verses. Here's how you're going to submit. So actually, the men have a little bit of a harder job because they have to love Christ. They have to love their wives as Christ loved the church. They have to have a Christ love for us. That's the way they submit to us. Okay, so it's not just women, I want a doormat, you're going to be a doormat, you will respect me. No, it's not, that's not what submission is. Submission doesn't mean just following mindlessly. It means following respectfully, coming alongside of him, being the, having the God-given design that he called us to be as a woman is a helpmeet, a counterpart, a helper. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so... When you're talking about, uh, let's look at the first, first Peter 3, 1 and 2. It says, In the same way you wives must accept the authority of your husbands, then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Everybody say, without any words. Oh, just kidding. I touched it. Without any words and say, they will be won over. Okay. 
let's face it, ladies, there are plenty of things that we are capable of leading in, in our families. Plenty of things. We, we know more about the kids. We know more about their schedules. We know what probably really, you know, gets to the kids, what disciplines there should be. There's plenty of things that we can lead in and be f- totally fine. There's plenty of things we could do financially within our, our, our household or what we think would be best. Plenty of things. But that's not how God designed it for the blessing to come on your family. God designed it for the man to lead and the woman to come alongside. So how how do we do that if a man doesn't necessarily, it's not his natural tendency to want to lead, or you think that he's just not leading right now? He's just not leading. Because maybe you've been the problem, ladies. I said I was just going to step on it. That's about as hard as I'm going to step on your toes. All right there. Okay. But it's true. Like, I want to give you a few scenarios of what um, several different marriages can look like. So you might have, the first scenario might be where there's a dominating man and a weak woman, just a doormat woman. Okay. I've seen those kinds of marriages. And you know what happens is it produces weak children. Because, again, it's not the commanded blessing of the Lord when that's the case. So, but, and, and for the life of me, I don't understand why a dominating man would just want a weak-willed woman. Because if you want a good, strong lineage, you need a good, strong woman to raise your children. I mean, who wants weak children? Like, it's just the dominating man just going to shoot yourself in the foot. So I don't know, like I said, I don't understand that part, but... That's how some people roll, and that's not how God wants us to roll. There's a second scenario that where you have a passive man and a very strong woman, okay? That produces confused children because, again, that's not how God designed us to lead. If we, if we want the commanded blessing of the Lord, we should have a man that understands the weight of leading a fully submitted wife, okay? So what does a fully submitted wife look like? Me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was babe. <laughs> a fully submitted wife is not just one that goes along with everything that my husband says. Let me just tell you, this is the most wonderful thing that you can do is to be a fully submitted wife. I have plenty of opinions. I do. I was waiting for the Amen. I have plenty of opinions, but here's what's the beauty of it is I get to voice my two cents and then it's his responsibility. And when, when I figured that out, it was awesome. I was talking to a friend this week and they, it, this was in, this is one of the, the couples that we had counseled. My husband had counseled in particular and she's a strong woman and she was like, my husband's just not going to lead. And he said, lay down the reins and don't pick them up. She was like, yes, yeah, he's not going to do it. He's not going to lead. Lay down the reins and refuse to pick them up. And she's like, okay, fine. And it was tough sometimes, and she, but she did it. And you know what? The husband is brilliantly leading his family and beautifully leading his very strong-willed wife. And it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing because that's the way God designed it. And there's... Um, there's certain scenarios where you might think, okay, what does it look like? I, this is a part where I want to put some meat on the bones. So, like, I, I've talked to several women who they've said, you know, well, I, I asked my husband, and he just doesn't give me anything. He doesn't lead me. I'll ask him again until he leads you. Well, what does that look like, Stacey? How do I do that? How do I continue to ask him, you know, if I'm not nagging? Okay, but here's the thing. What you don't want to do, ladies, is you ask him. And, you know, you, let's just take an example for, like, disciplining the children. That was one of the things that I would, I would come in and I'd say, you know what, honey, I've done this and this and this, and I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to, how, to, how to, you know, where to go from here. And now if he said whatever he said, let's just say he said X, Y, Z, and I said, well, that's stupid. Do you think that he's going to want to ever give me advice again? No, because I just made him feel incompetent. I just made him feel like, I know better, okay? So, ladies, you need to actually say, if, if he doesn't say anything, just like, well, you know, you know what to, you should do. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> then you, again, respectfully, by building him up and honoring him, you say, honey, 
I think you have wisdom that I just don't know what to do. I really just need your input right now. Is that, is that honoring him? Yeah, it's, it's building him up. It's telling him, I believe in you, okay? And it, it might not happen Thursday, might not happen tomorrow. But sooner or later, if you keep doing that, it's going to build him up and he's going to start leading. There are plenty of cases right here in this church, right here in this room, where they will tell you it works. And then what happens, honestly, it's our goal to get everyone on the same page because we gain freedom and protection and God's favor when this happens in our marriages. The, I want to say this. When, when, when you do things God's way by God's principles, he always blesses it. Amen. He always blesses it. This is like the tithe, you know, the, the principle of the tithe. You might not like it, but it works. You might not like this fact of the submit to one another, but it works. If you want the commanded blessing of favor on your family, do it. Do it this way. Because when we have favor on our families, we have favor on our communities. We have favor on our communities, then we have favor in our towns, in our cities, in our church. And it goes from there. But just because we did the one thing that God said with the most important relationship here on this earth is I submitted to my husband and he submitted to me the way he was supposed to submit to me. He loved me as Christ loved the church. There's a commanded blessing and favor on that when we do things God's way. But so many times... it. The devil twists and turns it. So you may have giftings. You may think, but I understand what our family needs to work. Then draw it out of your husband. Let him lead. Make him feel competent. Help him to lead. That's what we're good at. Men, let us help me help you. Okay? Seriously. Like, if you just listen to your wife sometimes, what she's trying to say. Women, that's what we women are going to try to do better is say it better. Turn the nagging to bragging. You know, honor him. Build him up. We've got to be able to submit to one another. And here's the thing. Um, in John 10, 17, Jesus shows us a beautiful picture of what submission truly is as a sign of strength. Because in, in John 10, 17, he's, talk, he, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he did not want to do what was set before him. But he submitted to the Father's will. He submitted so much so that he was sweating blood. I have never sweat blood when I didn't want to follow my husband. I was irritated, but I had never gotten to that point. But it's a sign of submission. I mean, it's a sign of strength to be able to fully submit. Jesus fully submitted to his Father's will even when he didn't want to. And there was a blessing on it. When I fully submit to my husband, and there have been times where I really didn't want to. I mean, and, and I was thinking, this is going to be really damaging. This, this has great consequences. I was not happy about it. I was not happy what I thought his wisdom was. I didn't think it was wisdom, period. But I did it because I knew. I was like, gosh, th I, th I was close to sweating blood on that one. So I was like, this is not a good idea. I was like, okay, honey, I'll, I'll follow you respectfully. Just kidding, I probably didn't follow him respectfully on that one. But um, I did follow. And you know what happens? You may be thinking, there may be, it may be a big financial decision that you just really can't submit, or you think it's really going to not work out the right way, or it could be really damaging. You know what happens? Is Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good Amen. for those that love the Lord. He will cover you if you just do it right. And you know what, ladies? Sometimes when that responsibility is on your husband and he has made a bad choice or a poor decision and, and it comes crashing down, which, again, many couples that we've talked to, and that's happened, it only has to happen once usually because the man feels the responsibility. And ladies, what do you do when that happens? You don't go, see, I told you so. Incompetence pushes their heart away. No, you say, you know what, honey? I'm glad we're in this together. I'm with you. Whatever, you. whatever you do, I'm with you. That tells him, I'm with you. I'm building you up. I'm honoring you. No matter what, I'm with you. And we're going to get this through this together. So that's what a picture of, of submission looks like. 
and it's because it's a sign of strength. And we have to do it to one another. We have to submit to one another. So I want you to stand with me this morning. And like I said before, this is a godly biblical principle that if you do it, it works. If you do it, it works, period. You will have favor on your marriage if you understand these things. Ladies, if you, if you build up your husband, you honor him, and you submit to his leadership, it can transform your marriage. Again, there's plenty of people that would tell you, I've done it, it works, I promise. So we're gonna pray in just a few minutes and um, we're gonna pray for just a couple different, uh, different types of um, groups here, but if you'll just close your eyes and bow your heads, and we're gonna pray. I wanna ask you, I think that um, you know a lot of times people can't fully submit to one another if their heart is not fully submitted to Christ. And he's the one that gives us that strength to be able to do these things. And so I'm gonna ask this first group of people that I wanna pray for, I wanna ask if there's anyone in here that's you've never, that you've never given your heart to Christ, I want you to just raise your hand and be able to say, I wanna submit my life to Christ first before I ever can even think about submitting to anything else, anybody else. I wanna just submit my life to Christ and say, that I give you the helm. So if you'll raise your hand if that's you. And if you're online and you're watching, yes, I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great decision. Best decision you'll make. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I see your hand. If you're online, you can pray this prayer at home as well. Um, before I pray that prayer, I want to ask for the second group of people. And I want to ask you if, ladies in particular, if you want to do a better job at all these things, at building up your husband, at being able to use your God-given gift and design to be able to better your marriage. I want you to raise your hand, ladies. Awesome, all across the room. And men, for those of you who, you were here last week and you also, you wanna be able to submit to one another and you wanna submit to your wife by loving her the way Christ loved the church, I want you to raise your hand. All across the room, it's awesome. Okay, you know what this tells me is that this church wants to have the commanded blessing and favor of the Lord. So I'm gonna pray for you. And I want everyone to say this first part for this first group, for those few new brothers and sisters in Christ. I want you to just repeat after me, everyone. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for dying on the cross for me. I believe that you rose from the dead and that you are alive right now. I ask you to come into my life change me, transform me, and make me new. I confess you as my Lord and Savior, and I thank you, Jesus, for the work and the testimony that you're gonna do in my life here on out, in Jesus' name. And let me pray for the rest of you. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name that you would bring the commanded blessing and favor of the Lord on each marriage in here, on, on the, all the relationships in here, the families, so that we can win people over without even saying a word. So that when people come into our church building, that they would be able to have, so, they would be able to feel your anointing just because there's favor on our families, favor on our marriages. And it starts with building up our husbands and loving our wives and honoring our husbands husbands and spouses in Jesus name. I thank you, Lord, that we are going to fully submit to one another as we fully submit to you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would just anoint each person here, that they would be able to, to have the strength to make the changes in their marriages that they need to make. We thank you, Jesus, for just being with us today. And everybody said, amen. Amen. And thank you, Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for those people who are new brothers and sisters in Christ.